Thank you all very much for uh, being with us today. The uh, topic we've been discussing is uh, dealing with the Ebola crisis. Ebola is frightening. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and it is a very serious disease. It is nothing to trifle with, which uh, we are learning uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and it is a situation where how government performs uh, actually matters. Uh, and we've seen that also over the past several days. Uh, having the right equipment, having the right knowledge, a government that is competent makes uh, all the difference in the world here. Uh, we've been watching the situation in Dallas unfold. And uh, I think the disadvantage that Dallas had was uh, it was the first in some ways. And it was a case of first impression that Dallas had to deal with. Uh, we have the advantage of watching what happened in Dallas and being able to learn from their experience uh, and, frankly, learn from the mistakes that were made in the Dallas situation. Now, in New York, we have been operating, New York, we've been operating under the assumption that at some point we would have to deal with an Ebola case. Why? Uh, because our operating model is better safe than sorry, err on the side of caution. Uh, that's been our operating model for four years. Assume the flood hits, assume the storm hits, prepare for it. If we're pleasantly surprised, we're pleasantly surprised. But uh, we'll always be prepared for the worst. So we have been preparing for the past several weeks, assuming that uh, we are called upon to deal with an Ebola case. And we've been developing more and more practices, uh, best practices, and more and more sophistication about how to deal with these matters as we've been going along. We've been operating drills with hospitals to make sure the hospitals are ready. How would they react? Do they have the right equipment? Do they have the right protocols? Because everything is about having the protocols, having the equipment, and complying with those protocols. Um, we'll talk through now in some detail the steps that we've actually uh, performed already and will be undertaking. But the uh, simple version is we've identified eight hospitals within the state. These eight hospitals will be hospitals that will be used uh, in the case uh, that we actually have an Ebola case or suspected Ebola case. We will use these eight hospitals as a matter of first response. Uh, these eight hospitals uh, will be going through training, drilling, uh, with the, with the, with their personnel, to make sure that they are fully prepared uh, to handle the case. There's a regional distribution to the eight hospitals. We'll be adding more as time goes on. We are also spending time training people who will actually be on the first lines, right, and envisioning scenarios whereby we would be dealing with an Ebola case. Uh, so you see around the table representatives from uh, Port Authority, which operates the airports, uh, MTA that operates the trains, uh, health care system, uh, certainly, um, hospital workers in the case that somebody presents themselves at a hospital. But we've been training the literally the first line of defense, which will be the hospital workers, which will be health care workers in general, which will be uh, police department at airports, uh, airport workers, MTA workers, people who are working in mass transit, people who are at Penn Station, Grand Central, et cetera. And we're getting them the training that they need. We're also uh, training and running unannounced drills uh, on a practical circumstance basis. In other words, uh, we'll run drills where someone is on a New York City subway train and uh, that person becomes ill under circumstances that one might think the person uh, might have a, uh, be an Ebola uh, candidate. And how do you handle the case f 
from the New York City subway system to an ambulance to the right hospital and then the right protocol in the right hospital. Uh, so those practical drills are what we're now going to be moving to on an unannounced basis. Uh, but literally coordinating the entire system. Airports, trains, uh, uh, terminals, and the right hospitals in the right regional areas with the right training in place. Um, with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Zucker, who is the Acting Commissioner of the Health Department, who has been spearheading our effort, uh, and he'll give you further detail. We'll then hear, hear from uh, Tom Prendergast at the MTA and Patrick Foy from the Port Authority. Dr. Zucker. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Let me uh, walk you through uh, what we have been doing and what we will be doing. And I think the best way to focus on this is to pay our attention to exactly every step of the way that we've uh, moved forward. You will hear about what the Port Authority is doing, uh, MTA and others, and I will defer to them. But once a patient is brought into the system, let's walk from there. The, we are working, the Department of Health is working with the local health departments because many times the first place um, someone will show up, it will either be in an urgency center or an ambulatory care center, and we have worked with the local health department to make sure that they are contacted by these uh, urgency centers or uh, ambulatory care centers and, and other places that someone may come in. We are also working closely with physicians and, uh, and he other health professionals to make sure that those professional societies are also uh, aware of what we need to do and uh, are prepared to recognize the patient with Ebola. If someone was brought in to the hospital, they may come in through that way, or they may come in through the EMS system. So we're working closely. We've had multiple phone calls with them, with the 911 system, to make sure that they are aware of how to identify a patient uh, and to provide that uh, appropriate information ahead of time and also to protect themselves as well. Uh, at the same time, we're working with the hospitals. And let's talk a little bit about that. So now if a patient has been, brought, uh, has been identified and is brought into a hospital, we realize that we need to have all the hospitals prepared. Um, a couple weeks ago, right after the first case was identified, uh, as the governor has mentioned, uh, uh, the governor charged the department to find out what our hospitals are, how prepared are they, and the department asked all the hospitals to do exercises in the emergency room with actors or, or individuals who possibly could uh, simulate someone with Ebola. And we found a lot of information from that, and we filled all the, uh, we worked on um, uh, making sure that we would fill any of the holes that were the gaps in the system there. So that was very helpful. And as you heard uh, the governor just mentioned, we will continue to do this in, in other areas. And we will also ask the hospitals to, to do this again, uh, to look at uh, after we move forward. Uh, we're working also on three areas, early recognition of patients, rapid isolation and diagnosis, and the appropriate care. Um, we have eight hospitals uh, identified. We, uh, the hospitals that have been identified uh, so far as Mount Sinai, New York Presbyterian, Bellevue, Long Island Jewish Medical Center, uh, and, uh, down, and uh, nor um, North Shore LIJ, Downstate, uh, and, and Montefiore, and also upstate or outside of the, uh, the city area, um, SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, uh, as well as Stony Brook Downstate uh, and University of Rochester Medical Center. And we expect that there will be other hospitals as well. Um, the governor asked uh, me to issue a commissioner's order, and that will require hospitals to develop the protocols, the training, and the drills to address the early recognition and the safe handling of possible Ebola patients. So going forward, we will continue to work with all these designated hospitals around the protocols for a known Ebola patient. But as I had mentioned, we must be sure that all hospitals are prepared to identify someone who comes into their emergency room. Many times people just walk in right off the street to an emergency room, and it's important to recognize and identify those people. Uh, we are having a meeting with uh, the EMS, the Emergency Medical Services, as I mentioned before, is another avenue that they can come in. Uh, regarding the Commission's orders, we will uh, be working and continue to have multiple calls with the, the hospitals as they move forward to uh, meet the orders that will be put in place, and we will do, continue to do inspections as well. Uh, starting Monday, the Department will be sending out uh, teams into the hospitals to monitor their progress uh, in this area, and we have identified a priority scheme for that, and we will move forward on that issue as well. Um, we have a stockpile of uh, personal protective equipment, and we're working with all the other parts of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the state departments uh, that are uh, here today uh, to ad address all the needs and, and what, are, what are needed. We have a, an emergency stockpile. Uh, we have a, um, 
um, a supply area the department does, and I took a tour of that just uh, uh, the other day to make sure that we have equipment there and what, what else do we need, and I'm working closely with the Department of Homeland Security on that as well. We've teamed up, as I said, with multiple different agencies to make sure this is a seamless process and that there are no problems here and that we can move forward and make sure that we identify patients, treat them, uh, identify them, test them, treat them, and care for them as, um, as New York has always done in providing quality, uh, excellent care to all patients. Uh, regarding uh, working with uh, SUNY and CUNY uh, to ensure a swift and appropriate response on our colleges and university campuses, we have many, many students across the state and we're working with, with the uh, universities as well to make sure that the students are safe. And we have many students that come from around the world in New York. This is a, a, a center for education as, as we all know as well. And we're also discussing this with the Department of Education regarding primary schools. It's not just uh, those in uh, um, colleges or, or graduate schools, but also those in the primary school. I know that most people are, are very concerned about those kind of issues when, when uh, children are involved. Uh, we're working with the MTA and the Port Authority. You'll hear more about that. Um, and we're also working with the, with the labs. We have a dedicated, to, to um, uh, summarize this, I would like you to know that we have a dedicated um, website on our, um, on our Department um, of Health uh, website for all this information. And we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. With that, we'll turn to Patrick Foy from the Port Authority. Uh, first things first, ensuring the health and safety of everyone who uses or works at all Port Authority facilities, and we're going to focus on airports today, is our top priority. Under the Governor's leadership, we've been working with the State Department of Health, Zucker, Dr. Zucker and his colleagues, CDC, Customs and Border Protection, U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Public Health Service, and the rest of our federal, state, and local partners to ensure that the personnel at our airports in, especially the police, and we've been in close consultation with the port, each of the Port Authority police unions, that each of our people are fully prepared to handle potential patients or travelers with Ebola or, or any other infectious disease. At JFK, in coordination with personnel from the Centers for Disease Control and Pre Prevention, Customs and Border Protection, and the U.S. Coast Guard, advanced screenings commenced on Saturday <clears throat> using detailed questionnaires for passengers originating in the three West African nations. I can report at this time no passengers arriving from any of the three West African nations have been identified at this time as having the Ebola virus. I'll note that the Port Authority Police Department is deploying ambulances per shift 24 hours a day at each of our airports to ensure in the event it's necessary timely and safe transport of potential passengers, potential patients with Ebola. In addition, this Friday, left a, mess, a meeting here at the governor's office and went out to JFK to view personally a drill run by the CDC, Customs and Border Protection, and the U.S. Public Health Service, along with the Coast Guard, which held a practice drill with the Port Authority and other federal, state, and local partners on Friday afternoon to ensure that when advanced screening began on Saturday, that each of those agencies, including the Port Authority Police and Port Authority Aviation, were able to ensure preparedness for scenarios in which passengers who may have been affected with the virus were properly handled. Lastly, Governor Cuomo has directed us to coordinate with each of the international state airports around the state to coordinate with respect to procedures and practice and to share best practices that we have learned over the months that we've been preparing for this. We've uh, convened the Port Authority Pandemic Working Group. That uh, process with the upstate international airports will commence today. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now go to Tom Prendergast, Chairman of the MTA. I'd like to thank the Governor for convening us today. Uh, the MTA has been and always been taking steps to ensure that we're protecting our customers and all of our employees. Uh, we already have in place established protocols for dealing with the disposal uh, and removal in, uh, of infectious waste as it's found on the system. We have had these protocols reviewed by the New York State Department of Health and they have deemed them to be effective not only for normal infectious waste but also in the treatment of an Ebola virus should it be on the, found in the system. The procedures involve the removal of revenue service equipment like buses and trains for them to be effectively cleaned as well as the isolation of areas where this infection waste may be found in the system. They involve the use of aggressive cleaning agents like bleach to disinfect trains and platforms and the use of the proper proper use of personnel protective equipment to protect our employees as they perform those tasks. We have met with all the labor unions and John Samuelson's here from the Transport Workers Union Local 100 to ensure the consistent and effective implementation of this because we want to make sure that we're doing everything right and the protocols are being followed. Thank you. 
so to uh, reiterate, we have, uh, we're trying to train the entire system, uh, trying to get the entire system uh, up to speed, but we are also developing specialized capacity and identifying certain facilities, certain workers where we can. So we have over 200 hospitals in the state. Uh, all 200 are being prepared so they could identify a case of Ebola if it should walk in the door. But we're going to have eight identified hospitals that uh, have intensive training and protocols, and they've already been identified as the hospitals uh, that we would use uh, if we needed them. Uh, same with the uh, MTA and the uh, Port Authority. Uh, all employees will be trained, but specialized units within them, special personnel who will have uh, more intensive training. So if there's a situation, they would be the ones uh, to respond. The upstate airports, upstate train stations, et cetera, will be receiving training uh, from the uh, Port Authority and the MTA, uh, respectively. Uh, this is very much a group effort and a coordinative effort. Uh, we've been working very closely with the federal government and the CDC, New York City, City of Albany, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, uh, et cetera. I want to thank all our local and federal partners very much uh, for their coordination. I also want to thank the people who are around this table, uh, the police departments that are on the front lines, uh, the transit workers that are on the front lines, the airport workers that are on the front lines because that's where we would first encounter this, uh, uh, this dangerous situation. Uh, and this is not in their job description. It's not what you sign up for when you sign up to be a transit worker. Uh, but everyone has responded uh, admirably and generously and professionally. And I want to publicly thank them all for it. Uh, also, um, we are, uh, as I said, our MO has been to err on the side of caution. Uh, and that's why we're doing all this. Uh, we've erred on the side of caution for four years. Uh, sometimes we go through a lot of preparation and the situation never presents itself. Uh, fine. I would rather that uh, than the alternative, which is we're unprepared. And that's what we're doing here. We are preparing uh, if the situation presents itself, which we do not have any reason to believe it's going to happen. So uh, I know the news is frightening. I know the front page of the newspaper is frightening. The TV news is frightening. Uh, and Ebola, Ebola is a, a frightening disease, no doubt. Uh, we've dealt with Ebola before. We've heard of it before. This is not the first time uh, the world has dealt with Ebola. And uh, you want caution, but we also want to keep perspective. We are prepared. Uh, and there's no reason for undue anxiety. There's no, no reason for panic. Uh, this city and this state uh, are probably uh, the most prepared in the country for situations like this with the best operations, the best infrastructure, and the best personnel. With that.